Welcome back to Psychedelic Therapy Frontiers, the podcast devoted to exploring the frontiers of psychedelic medicine and what it takes to cultivate a healthy mind, body, and spirit. I'm Dr. Steve Thayer, and today my co-host, Dr. Reed Robison, and I discuss the most fantastic of fungi, psilocybin mushrooms. We explore the ancient and modern history, therapeutic and ceremonial uses, and current research on this fantastic medicine. Whether you're new to psychedelics or an experienced psychonaut, there's something in this episode for you. We really appreciate you listening to the show. If you're feeling compassionate and generous and you want to help us out, please leave a five-star review on the platform you're listening to. If you leave a review on Apple Podcasts, you can write us a little message and tell us what you like, maybe even what you don't. Thanks again for listening. Please enjoy today's episode. Hey, Steve. Hey, Reed. You want to hear one of my favorite quotes lately? Always. By the one and only Maria Sabina. Yeah, let's hear it. Yeah. She said, heal yourself with the light of the sun and the rays of the moon, with the sound of the river and the waterfall, with the swaying of the sea and the fluttering of birds. Heal yourself with mint, neem, and eucalyptus. Sweeten with lavender, rosemary, and chamomile. Hug yourself with a cocoa bean and a hint of cinnamon. Put love in tea instead of sugar and drink it, looking at the stars. Heal yourself with the kisses that the wind gives you and the hugs of the rain. Stand strong with your bare feet on the ground and with everything that comes from it. Be smarter every day by listening to your intuition. Looking at the world with your forehead, jump, dance, sing, so that you live happier. Heal yourself with beautiful love and always remember, you are the medicine. Bang. She she figured it out. <laughs> Maria Sabina, truth, love, bomb. Mm. I want to hug myself with a cocoa bean now and uh, get kissed by the moon. <laughs> That's, I love that. That's incredible. So, yeah, isn't it? Uh, maybe for the benefit of our audience, people who maybe haven't heard of Maria Sabina, tell us a little bit about her and our topic today. Yeah, she's, uh, she's our curandera hero Mm -hmm. uh, from Mexico, a medicine woman essentially who worked with psilocybin magic mushrooms to heal and bless lives of so many people down in Mexico. And she was discovered by Gordon and Valentina Wasson back in the 50s. And it, um, they went down seeking an experience with her to learn from her and, and kind of feel what this was all about. And then it ended up on the cover of Time Life magazine in mm-hmm. 1957. Yeah. yeah, bringing a lot of attention to psilocybin, to these oh, yeah. little children, uh, the magic mushrooms that we now are so excited about using to help treat things like depression and addiction. and These little children, I love that. Uh, Ninos Sagrados, mm-hmm. they're um, called it such a cute name for magic mushrooms. Yeah. Uh, sacred children. Yeah. I love the like the the anthropomorphization. How about how was that for a word? Um, mm-hmm. of psychedelic medicines. Your grandmother ayahuasca or the little children and Yeah. We talked also in other episodes about entities and things like that, but they there there's a spirit, there's a signature, there's yeah. an animism to some of these things. Like an onomatopoeia <laughs> of sorts. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just throw cool words out. Yeah. Uh, so Maria Sabina, um, such an amazing like inspiration and figure in this psychedelic renaissance. Mm -hmm. Um, And you know, we were talking about the Wassons, and I think it's worth mentioning that Gordon Wasson gets all the credit these days, but it was actually his wife, Valentina Pavlovna, Mm -hmm. she grew up in Russia, Wasson, a pediatrician and very brilliant mycologist and ethnomycologist mm. who uh, I've got to, I've got to believe was more of the, uh, the brains and the enthusiasm behind that voyage. Right. Yeah. Watson's usually the one that get that Gordon is usually the one that gets cited as sort of making the discovery, having the experience and bringing it back to the States. Yeah. It's kind of a sad, uh, um, shows the sad state of our misogynistic culture, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, so we're bringing Valentina back. (laughs) Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So we're talking about psilocybin today and there certainly are other, maybe even podcast episodes or, 
you know, documentaries or Mm -hmm. blog posts, books, where you could learn a lot about psilocybin. So we're not going to go into super deep detail of the history, play by play, slide by slide, step by step, but hit some of the highlights that we're fans of, talk about some Mm -hmm. of the research that's going on right now, uh, recent research, um, and then uh, some of the ways that we think psilocybin might be pivotal in this psychedelic mental health renaissance we like to talk about yeah, so much. It's a fun topic. Mm-hmm. By the way, did you see uh, on Netflix How to Change Your Mind psilocybin episode? You know, I still haven't watched the How to Change. I know it's like blasphemy in this community that yeah. I have not watched the the Netflix episode yet. Uh, but it's, yeah, it's on my queue. The only reason I bring it up is because at the beginning of that episode, Michael Pollan gets hoppied. Really? Oh, yeah. And he gets... He gets his world rock. <laughs> he gets blasted. Huh? Oh yeah, um, Erica, I think, was the name of the the shaman who mm-hmm. administered it. She actually had like a liquid hape in a syringe, and really? uh, yeah, and blasted it in each nostril, and then had a feather mm-hmm. and medicine songs. And he was shaking. She encouraged him to shake, like move the energy. But uh, I thought it was fun because last. Last time we talked about hape. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, liquid hape. And you can find liquid hape preparations. We've used some of those. Yeah. Uh, they're out there. And it's a little bit of a different, certainly a different experience than a bunch of mapacho powder blown up your nose. But We may have used one of those before podcasting today. We may have. <laughs> <laughs> Cannot and confirm or deny. Yeah. Even though we could legally confirm or deny if we felt like it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was pretty neat to see. Yeah. Even if you watch the first five minutes, you'll see it. Um, and maybe we'll link to it in the show notes. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> you'll have to look at the show notes, folks, to, yeah. to find out. Steve writes those. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> it was a, a subtle message to me to put it in the show notes. Yeah. So yeah, uh, these mushrooms have been around, we think, for thousands of years. Been around meaning, I mean, I'm sure they've existed on the planet. Mm-hmm. Although some people suspect they might have been transported here by aliens or by a meteorite impact. Fungus are a weird organism. Um, fantastic fungi is a, is a cool place to look for information on that. But that was an amazing movie. Mm-hmm. Um, if you haven't seen it, go watch it and have a watch party. <laughs> Just made me think of Paul Stamets and this recent picture I saw, I think he even posted it on, uh, online of him covered in bees. Have you seen this? He's oh, yeah. arms open. And he's just covered in bees. Cause he's, I love that. he's doing work on like, you know, saving the bees with, uh, yeah. He's done so much in, in the modern day for mycology. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. How, like his Ted talk seen by millions and millions about how mushrooms will save the world. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I even, I heard him, I don't know if he said this and maybe on his appearance on Joe Rogan's podcast where after Michael, Michael Pollan published how to change your mind, the book, um, in there, cause I think Pollan interviews Stamets. Yeah. Um, they go foraging. Yeah. Yeah. And Pollen, I guess, tried to not put in too many details about yep. the foraging spot, but uh, I've heard Stamets say that people figured it out and now he had to find a new spot. I bet they did. And Paul Stamets knows how to find spots. I'm He's sure. characterized so many species of of mushroom. But uh, yeah, his in I remember in uh, Fantastic Fungi, he tells the story of how he had stuttering mm, um, yeah. and this severe like stuttering that would come on before he'd like talk to anyone if he was nervous. Like he used an example of this girl he wanted to talk to and couldn't, but, but then he takes a whopping dose of uh, psilocybe mushrooms of some kind and climbs up in a tree (laughs) and has his trip while it's raining and lightning and Mm -hmm. thundering. And then from that day forward, he never had stuttering again. If, if I'm telling the story, right. I remember it that way. Yeah. Yeah. I also remember thinking like climbing a tree is probably not the safest thing to do while on mushrooms, but who am Paul. I to judge? <laughs> who am I to judge? He um, survived it. Yeah. Uh, so it brings up a couple thoughts. Mm-hmm. One is back in the 60s, just a few years after that cover of Life magazine comes out with Gordon mm-hmm. and Valentina's um, exploration and visit to Mar- Marie Sabina, Tim Leary and Dick Alpert, AKA Ram Das, were doing psilocybin research at Harvard. And they were the ones who really d- 
described, characterized, set and setting mm. in 1960. Yeah, well, he, you hear that term a lot, set and setting. Um, and uh, when I remember when I first came across that, read about it when I was learning about psychedelic assisted psychotherapy and how important set and setting were. I was, I always, like at first I thought, what the hell is set? That doesn't make any sense, but it's in reference to mindset. So yeah, yeah. your mindset and the setting, I guess set and setting, the alliteration was just sexier. So that's what- uh, Set and setting. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite set and setting stories is just a couple years later, like 1962, the Good Friday experiment mm. that they did, um, Tim Leary and uh, Dick Alpert were involved, um, but Walter Pankey, I think, spearheaded it, but where they gave uh, how much? 30 milligrams of psilocybin, so three to four dried grams, to 20 divinity students at the Harvard Divinity School in the Marsh Chapel during a sermon. <laughs> And, uh, well, 10 had mushrooms, 10 had placebo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if I remember right from the data, from the report that many of those seminary students described this psilocybin experience in their top five most spiritual experiences they've ever had. Oh yeah. And these are people who, you know, I'm assuming scripture study and prayer and all kinds of religious devotion, uh, are part of their lives. Super fascinating that this <laughs> substance would have triggered Again, we're talking about the setting of the chapel, the mindset that they bring to it uh, of their, mm -hmm. you know, the, all the spiritual practice amplified by this fungus. Yeah. So fun fact. Um, well, first of all, of the 10 who got psilocybin, nine out of 10 went on to become ministers. Of the 10 who got placebo, zero out of 10. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. And you know who, who did the research? The grad student who did that research? I believe it was Rick Dobler. Yeah. Isn't that yeah. crazy? That was his thesis. Yeah. I, I'm, I don't know exactly where he was. I think Naropa mm. doing his doctorate. And is that also, was that the study where one of those 10 that got psilocybin didn't have a good time? Like, didn't, oh, yeah. didn't he take <laughs> off? They had to sort of tackle him. He tried to run out of the, yeah. the building. Yeah. Yeah. There's even, <laughs> I pulled a quote from that experience, one of them said, there were bars of color and I was floating through them and they were floating through me. And it was just glorious. The bars of color then resolved into a wheel and I was at the center. There was a different color going out from me in every possible direction. Sounds like psilocybin, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I realized I had to swim out of one of those color bars. Each of those color bars would be a whole different life experience. I had to choose one and I couldn't. It was very painful. <laughs> it felt like my insides were being ripped out of me and I died, period, mm. end quote. <laughs> Yeah, the varieties of the psilocybin experience. He describes it as being both amazing and terrible. Yeah. Um, so what a set and setting to like get psilocybin then as a divinity student hear a sermon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they heard choirs of angels. I bet they did. Yeah. <laughs> it makes so one thing it brings up for me is that psilocybin may change your mind. We'll talk about the mechanisms, but I don't believe it changes your spirituality or your religion by default, but it can certainly deepen it. Yeah. Like it's made believers out of unbelievers. <laughs> That's right. And I've heard people who have turned to psychedelics, psilocybin in particular, um, and these are people who have gone on quite the journey spiritually. Yeah. And a couple of people who, um, in fact, there's even an account of this person in one of these studies who came to the medicine as an atheist and had some question about, is this medicine going to like... Yeah show me God. And, and, and they ended up having what they described as a very spiritual experience, but it didn't change the fact that they were self-described as an atheist, right? Mm -hmm. It didn't, it didn't uh, make them become Christian or, 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 uh, you know, adopt some kind of religious ideology, but it did, if I remember the description, right, it did help this person connect to whatever spirituality means for them. Yeah. Right? So that's the disclaimer then, like, psilocybin may uh, enhance your spirituality, may help you see God. It may um, even uh, bring back some of your, like your spirituality. Um, and you may go on a wild, weird trip, but, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, it may expose some of your cognitive dissonances or how you're not living in accord with your values. And it might even connect you to nature. There's a nature connectedness. Yeah make you more flexible, less judgmental perhaps. Yeah. It's interesting that there are these common types of experiences on a substance like psilocybin 
that has, as I said, as I said before, a variety of experiences, but we have yeah. enough accounts of what this is like for people to see commonalities. Connection to nature is one. Connection mm -hmm. to the divine is another. Some people experience ego dissolving, ego, ego dis disillusionment, where their sense yeah. of self sort of blends with the cosmos and the universe. Yeah. Um, there's often, uh, often, not always, but often a very euphoric, pleasant emotion or experience accompanied with that dissolving in unity. Yeah. Yeah. So such a fascinating medicine. And then what was it around, well, around 1970 or so mm -hmm. when it became banned. And there was, I think, a 50 year time period, nearly 50 years from when the studies were happening in the 50s, 60s to when one was finally approved. 2006, Johns Hopkins by Roland Griffiths. Um, that was that classic seminal paper of like psilocybin can occasion mystical experiences. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found a, a 2004 one, UCLA researchers begin clinical trials on psilocybin for the treatment of pain. Mm. So it was pain, anxiety, depression in patients with advanced stage cancer. So around those early oh, yeah. 2000s, it's finally you know, getting approved. Um, and I heard somebody describe this as the third psychedelic renaissance around this time. You know, another fun fact, you know who... Uh, um, isolated the chemical, like um, describe the chemical structure of psilocybin. Um, I thought the, I did. It's the, it's the... The one and only Albert Hoffman. Hoffman that's yeah, right. Yeah, it was like uh, late 50s. Yeah, late 50s. Uh, makes sense. He was a psychedelic chemist who like conjured up LSD. <laughs> so leave it to him to spark the psilocybin research renaissance as well. Well, and... and we talked about Sandoz Laboratories, I think, in our LSD episode, but I, Sandoz was distributing this endocybin or something like that. I forget exactly what it was called, but it was a, a, a trying to yeah. market a drug based on psilocybin. Until that all got smacked down. down. So, yeah, and we talked about that in the LSD episode, mm -hmm. the unfortunate uh, war on drugs and the headlines like, woman gives birth to a frog, right. <laughs> things like that. Right. Um, but uh, back in, in the psilocybin research history, there was a really fascinating paper in 2010 by David Nutt and mm. colleagues that ranked all the drugs of abuse in their potential for harm in various categories, um, including like health-related consequences, societal, like violence and crimes and accidents and things. And psilocybin was the safest drug mm -hmm. of them all. Yeah. Beat cannabis. Super yeah. interesting, right? Really, really, really hard. I don't know what the LD50 is on psilocybin. Like really, really hard <laughs> to, to consume enough fungal matter. <laughs> you know, if you're going to go at it, eating the natural occurring psilocybin yeah. uh, to actually hurt yourself, maybe make you really sick. But there, there is the concern yeah. of psychological harm, right? We've, we've talked elsewhere in other episodes on the podcast about maybe some of the situations or some of the humans who might want to avoid a psychedelic experience. Somebody who has uh, prodromal schizophrenia or has active psychosis or whose who's, um, attachment to reality is already a little loose, you might not want to kick that hornet's nest. Yeah, there, there was a big survey of difficult experiences looking at psilocybin that I found fascinating. I think it was out of Hopkins too. Um, but uh, so... People responding to a survey who had anywhere from like five to 10 psilocybin experiences and 39% rated it as the most, one, one of the top five most challenging experiences of their lives. Mm. That goes along with that other <laughs> metric that you cited of one of the top five most meaningful ones. Um, and 8% sought some kind of treatment after. Mm -hmm. um, and then... 85% of these survey respondents, respondents benefited from the experience. And a third of them said it was one of the top five most meaningful experiences of their lives. Right, which is, so if we go back to your comment about it being safe compared to these other drugs that, that are often abused, right? Drugs mm -hmm. of abuse. Um, it's, these experiences are, there's like, we're trying to use, leverage these experiences to actually help treat people who yeah. are addicted to these other drugs that are a lot more dangerous. 
like cocaine, for example. I was listening to, to Matthew Johnson from – he's with John Hopkins, right? I always forget. Yeah, yeah. And he was on Aubrey Marcus's podcast recently, and he noted that he's aware of, of a study that's happening at the University of Alabama – where they're testing psilocybin's effectiveness on treating cocaine use disorder. And he made the point that, you know, cocaine addiction is really, really rough. We don't have a lot of great treatments for cocaine use disorder, is the point that he was making. Yeah. And, you know, psilocybin does have a history of being used to treat uh, uh, nicotine addiction, right? Tobacco use. Yeah. And, And he was describing like people, they have the treatment, they come out talking about seeing God and like connecting to their inner child. And and they'd be like, yeah, but what about, what about your smoking? Oh yeah, of course. I'm never going to smoke again, but I want to tell you about how I saw aliens, right? That doesn't matter anymore. That smoking stuff. Yeah. It's almost as an aside, right? Yeah. That was, uh, yeah, that was a big contribution he and others made at Hopkins. I mean, it's huge because they paired it with CBT and published this study about how magic mushrooms help long-term smokers quit. And now um, his research at Hopkins on smoking cessation is the first federally funded like psychedelic grant in decades. Yeah. And it's, it is like you said, it is for smoking cessation, right? Yeah. And interesting they compared it with CBT. Yeah. Yeah. We often wonder uh, like which therapeutic approaches are going to be the quote unquote best in combination with uh, with psychedelics, because we we sort of don't have answers to those questions. Yeah, I kind of have a hunch that, like, you need some kind of intention around it. It might help people accidentally, but as long as you point some therapeutic arrow at it, psilocybin will like amplify it. Yeah, yeah, that's my that's my guess. Yeah, I think that the common factors that are present in almost any therapeutic approach will will probably do most of the the heavy lifting alongside the medicine Mm -hmm. um but yeah it remains to be seen so we've been talking about dosing it might help translate milligrams into what people hear um these days in the media of dried grams Mm. and things and also talk about dose in general because dose matters yeah yeah it does so when most people hear about you know the the dried grams of mushrooms um they they aren't my my guess would be most people don't know that like not every mushroom species has the same amount of psilocybin or psilocin in it right so psilocybe cubensis or golden teachers or whatever those tend to be the your standard intro mushrooms yeah. maybe a couple percent like psilocybin so in a gram of uh, magic mushrooms golden teacher you might have like ten milligrams of psilocybin, if you had a strain called penis envy, mm-hmm. it tends to be stronger. You'd have a higher number of milligrams. Yeah. Um, and there, there's even a test kit um, that you can buy, not just these roll safe kits we've talked about to know what's in it, but you can figure out the percentage um, mm. of the kit. I learned about it from one of our numinous colleagues. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. And there's, I mean, I've also heard it said that there are different percentages or concentrations depending on which part of the mushroom you eat stem versus flowering body versus like the cap right yeah and so because of all all this the fda the trials uh, to date have used synthetic psilocybin like we've Mm -hmm. done psilocybin studies here you've been uh one of the main facilitators on them and um and those were amazing to get to uh bring to Utah and witness, um, even though technically we didn't know if people were on psilocybin or placebo. It's it's another topic. It's a little hard to hide that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Placebo controlled trials for psychedelic studies are an interesting animal to wrestle with. Oh, yeah. Because, you know, like you just implied, it's these are supposed to be double blinded placebo controlled trials, meaning that we don't know whether they got the active ingredient or the placebo the study drug or the placebo, and they're not supposed to know either, right? They, they as in the uh, the trial participant. But when when the placebo is something like niacin, for example, it, it if you Google niacin, you'll you'll kind of know what to expect. Yeah. <laughs> and so you can get something like, oh, my my skin's flushing about twenty minutes after ingesting the pill. You turn red like a lobster, and your skin's tingling and on fire. <laughs> so that it runs a risk of unblinding. You know, unblinding for the participant themselves, mm-hmm. if they've done any, you know, 10 minutes worth of research before they participate in the trial. 
and unblinding for the guides. Yeah, it's also an interesting um, study design challenge where um, some of these studies we've done don't have a crossover, mm -hmm. or some people it's really left up to the roll of the dice, quite literally, of if they get the psychedelic or placebo. And some of the MAP studies, for example, have had a crossover where everyone can, if they want to, have an open-label experiment. But, but in reality, that costs a lot of uh, money and time. And you, know, you can see how some of these sponsors working hard to bring these things back to the people mm -hmm. um, you know, have budget constraints and other things. And sometimes you, gotta, you just need a single randomized dosing session. Yeah. And I'll, I'll be frank, for me, you know, seeing these people come into these clinical trials, many of them struggling because these trials are for usually for depression or, you know, mm -hmm. some treatment resistant depression. Yeah. Uh, and people have become so excited about the promise of psychedelics. They're clamoring to get into these clinical trials because for most people, that's the only way they can access this stuff above board. And so they come in, they're doing all the prep and they're hoping to get the medicine. And then, you know, like I said, hard to blind this and they don't get the medicine. Yeah, that's a, an exercise for the therapy team in managing disappointment and expectations, and um, it's another interesting one. Yeah, yeah, and credit to the these uh, companies that are doing these clinical trials. The training around that's been really good. Yeah, experience. Yeah, so um, there was a dose finding study at Hopkins that I found really useful because they looked at the different doses and. Um, for example, um, 30 milligrams of psilocybin was given to, um, like they would give 30 milligrams per 70 kilo person. Mm. And that's the equivalent of about five dried grams. Yeah. And, uh, and so at that dose, four out of five had one of the most meaningful experiences of their lives. At a 20 milligram dose, say three dried grams, all had, um, positive experiences and only one experienced any negativity where it was like a third of the other group, the higher dose group had a significant struggle as part of it, still meaningful. Mm -hmm. And then the trend continued at the lower doses, like at five milligrams, there were some lasting positive changes um, and even some, yeah, like in behavior, attitude, outlook, but uh, yeah, less pronounced and much less of a challenge too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, it raises interesting questions about uh, ideal dose and then what makes it, we've talked a little bit about this, but like what makes it helpful? Because the yeah. higher, it sounds like arguably the higher dose, the five dried gram equivalent dose um, is more, It's you're gonna get it more likely that you'll have a challenging experience, but challenging experience doesn't necessarily mean untherapeutic. Yeah, in, in some ways, and according to a lot of the data, we need it, we want it. Like we welcome it, and that's why we pay so much attention to the set and setting right, and right. Tr having trained facilitators and um, holding that safe, sacred space. Um, but so if you look at the Compass Pathway study, they released some like phase 2B data with a 30 milligram psilocybin group and a 10 milligram group. And the 10 milligram group was not statistically significant in helping depression. Mm. So what is that like uh, uh, a gram and a half? Mm. So it's interesting as people, um, as things get legalized like in Oregon or as they get decriminalized and people are seeking it out more, um, Dose does matter in its transformative potential, especially for the serious mental health conditions. Right, yeah. right. This also brings up a question about microdosing. You know, we had we yeah. had uh, Paul Austin on the podcast from the Third Wave talking a bit about microdosing mm -hmm. a few weeks ago. Um, but yeah, there's 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 a whole community of human beings that have been microdosing psychedelics, including psilocybin, for a long time. Um, making claims that it helps with creativity, it helps with, um, you know, mood, it helps with, uh, even I've even heard people kind of uh, replacing their Adderall with microdosed LSD or microdosed psilocybin, uh, but not a, not a ton of studies on this. But I think you came across some recent data on microdosing, yeah? Yeah, there was a study that 
just came out like last week mm-hmm. on um, it was a dub finally a placebo controlled blinded microdosing study. I think it was out of Buenos Aires, Cavana et al. Uh, in translational psychiatry, and not a huge study, but one that had thirty something people uh, receiving a microdose protocol with either psilocybin or placebo and um, a clever study design. And they even had some, everyone gets half a gram after and we do an EEG and we measure some things. Um, And they measure like physical activity, cognitive tests, all the other usual like openness, mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Um, And uh, yeah, there were trends towards some cognitive and creativity enhancing, but it wasn't statistically significant. And their conclusion like others have concluded is there's a strong placebo effect in microdosing and a strong expectancy bias. Right. Um, and as uh, psychiatric and psychology professionals, like, I mean, you tell me, but I certainly welcome the benefits of the placebo response or benefits from anywhere I can get them. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's, it's also important to understand. Yeah. Yeah. We want to make sure we're making as uh, accurate claims about what a medicine does. And placebo is just an interesting concept. Yeah. We call it the placebo effect. And then we, we, you know, in, in clinical research, you try to control for it. We want to rule out the placebo effect, mm-hmm. but what is it? What's going on? It's, it's so fascinating to me because if it's the power of the mind to affect change, sometimes in the body, like mm-hmm. literal change in the body, it like think a happy thought mm-hmm. and electrical signals in the brain fire and happy chemicals are released and trigger more of that cascade. It's really interesting. Like hope uh, is quite a potent therapy. Right. right. Hope heals, as they say. And on the flip side, there's the nocebo effect. Mm-hmm. Like you believe something is going to harm you, it's more likely to or you will kind of enhance the negative effects. This is seen in the, uh, there's some fascinating data on it in the uh, gluten sensitivity Mm. literature that I've followed uh, working a lot in eating disorders because, you know, we're faced with some life-threatening conditions um, like with anorexia nervosa sometimes and, and really need to hit that question head on of what can someone eat? Like if you have celiac disease, um, definitely don't have gluten. Um, if you don't, um, we want to make sure there's not a, a gluten sensitivity, mm-hmm. like hypersensitivity that is less well characterized. But, but some people, it's the rigidity in their mind that has limited it and a nocebo effect that has made them feel like it is harmful to them. But we've been able to reintroduce it carefully and get them through that. There have been studies on this where they, they test people, no celiac, no um, measurable gluten sensitivity, at least give the test that we can run. And then they give different groups, different food items, tell them that there's gluten in it, there's no gluten. And these people have strong GI reactions, gas, yeah. bloating, diarrhea, brain fog. The mind gut axis. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's a powerful connection. Um, so that's a little tangent, but, uh, yeah. but yeah, fascinating topic. Well, I think it is relevant to set and setting, like we we're talking about. I mean, yeah. basically, you're leveraging the effect of the quote unquote placebo effect by setting an intention. Mm-hmm. These medicines, we've heard them called non specific amplifiers. This, they, mm-hmm. they are so responsive to what you bring to them. Um, it's why I'm a little skeptical of those companies that are trying to make psychedelics without the psychedelic experience. I don't think it's not just what's happening in neurochemically in the mind, it's the experience itself mingled with the attitude you bring to it that can be so potentially so healing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get asked to help with people's difficult trips sometimes. Mm -hmm. Like even when I was on vacation last week or two, I got a call from someone back home um, who was trying to help a friend who had taken a high dose of a psychedelic and was in panic mode. And But I remember one time being asked to help someone who had just like lost their job and ended a long-term relationship and drove across the country to come back home um, and had little sleep. And then they jumped into a psychedelic group Mm -hmm. ceremony and they had a 
there I had a really difficult time. Like it's, it's not the recommended mindset to go in with it, even though sure we welcome difficult experiences. Um, you know, these can be difficult as is. Yeah. 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 And in that, uh, that difficult experiences survey that I was talking about earlier, uh, some, some of the predictors of difficult experiences were really interesting. Like one of them was, um, you're more likely to have a really challenging experience if you didn't have a safe, supportive guide who wasn't on the medicine. And if you also used cannabis, another one of the factors. Hmm. As in you're a cannabis user no, or use cannabis you in had conjunction? cannabis on board. Oh, interesting. Like if you're on LSD or psilocybin or something like that, and then you add cannabis, which some people like to do, um, it just increases your chance of, uh, of things going south or being really, really challenging. Yeah. I'm curious about combinations and I, and I think, you know, that'll come, the research on that will come. It's might be slow going, but you know, especially com combining MDMA with other psychedelics because of just the heart opening and yeah. uh, some of these softening effects that maybe potentially MDMA could have. Yeah. There's combinations that can be extremely strategic in theory, right? Like mm -hmm. you mentioned, MDMA, if I were to try and pick my favorite potential therapy that, you know, of course we can't study yet, but I'd like to one day for something like borderline personality disorder. Um, I might like MDMA to create that safe container and something like psilocybin then to dissolve ego structures and uh, like kind of melt those patterns. Yeah. Bring the love to the altered state yeah. and see what happens. Yeah, so that I, I could see following on as this renaissance progresses and we have these things approved, more and more available to research. And then, uh, you know, we could start to, think about, start to think about sequencing them or even combining them. Yeah. yeah. What would be, so kind of following up on that, what would be your dream application for psilocybin? Because right now it's being studied for a lot of things, mostly depression, and, you know, in Johnson's case, nicotine. Yeah. So psilocybin has uh, that stamp of fast track designation from the FDA for depression and treatment resistant depression right now. Mm -hmm. So depression by USONA and TRD by Compass. Um, but they're like, I think that uh, even more of a slam dunk, like I think those the data has been positive so far, and I think it will be approved if I were to wager a guess. Mm -hmm. um, you know, hopefully within the next couple of years, but if I were to pick a slam dunk for psilocybin, it would be um, like that's even more uh, kind of easily approved. It might be smoking cessation or another substance use disorder or end of life anxiety, serious illness related anxiety. And there's some striking studies of how one high dose of psilocybin uh, in someone with cancer-related anxiety or end-of-life anxiety um, just melts that away in the vast majority of people, lasting and yeah. in a meaningful way. I would love to back up from the end of your life, existential distress related to end of your life, and you know help people who are experiencing existential distress yeah. because of life, right? So maybe these are people who could change the trajectory. I have a lot of therapy clients, especially now after all the stressors of the pandemic and and uh, people looking at the what they feel like is the the downward trajectory of of the country yeah. or of the world, and you know global existential distress with climate change, things like that, and they could use a perspective shift now. Oh yeah, you know, not one right before six months before death because of cancer. It's it's so true and. Uh... That ties into what we mentioned in the LSD conversation we had of, we will be studying LSD for anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, and psilocybin has shown benefit in certain kinds of anxiety, especially when it's tied to a, like a situation, like a cancer related anxiety, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that's where things will, will head more and more indications um, because these do have a like these medicines do have a significant uh, effect in the brain that has you know multiple potential uses. So what's going yeah. on in the brain? Maybe people would like a little 
yeah. taste of what we think might be going on in the brain when you take psilocybin. Yeah. So um, do you remember the paper called Rebus mm -hmm. by Carhart Harris and colleagues out of Imperial College? It stands for Relaxed Beliefs Under Psychedelics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's got a, like a little E and all that. Right. They had to stretch to make the acronym, but I really like that paper. And it uh, when I read it, um, it was a while ago, it uh, an analogy hit me, like because basically Rebus says that psychedelics come in and relax the weight of tightly held prior beliefs. Um, so new, like they melt your old patterns so you can more consciously form new ones, mm -hmm. right? But uh, in my kind of yoga practice and when I've taught yoga, I used to use this analogy of practicing yoga is like heating up metal. So your body's like metal so you can bend it so it doesn't just like snap or resist. And so I see now the brain that way on psychedelics, like your body is in say a hot yoga room mm. um, where you heat it up so it's malleable. You relax the tight hold that it has so you can bend it, shape it into something else. And then it will, after that time window, the heat wears off, the window of neuroplasticity dissipates. Then you're in a new shape or a new, new patterns are in place. I like that. I like that because it helps us understand this word that you used, neuroplasticity. You'll hear that a mm -hmm. lot from these researchers or in reference to what we think is going on with the brain on psychedelics. Yeah. That it's more plastic. I watched this this video the other day of this drone. This guy was flying this drone and it uh, over this, this volcano. And so the drone does this low pass across the lava mm -hmm. and he flies it back and the props had melted. Oh, wow. And like were now bowed. Fortunately, he got his drone back. It made it all the way back. Mm -hmm. That's what plastic does. You know, that's that word yeah. plasticity. It's it's metaphorically heating up the mind, as you say, to help form new beliefs, otherwise rigid beliefs. Yeah. And so you'll often hear terms like neurogenesis or synaptogenesis. Mm -hmm. And we think this is happening in human brains. It's been shown in rat models, but you have possibly new neurons, new cells being the, the growth of which promoted by the presence of psilocybin, um, and then new connections between those neurons. So neurogenesis and synaptogenesis, the generation yeah. of new neurons and new connections. No, that's, uh, it's fascinating because, well, another paper that describes it in, a, in an important way comes out of the same group, Carhart Harris, they've been- They've been like, busy. Yeah, very productive, <laughs> but called the entropic brain mm. hypothesis. Um, because we've known, you know, for quite some time that we are prediction machines. Like our brains, via our bodies, take in sensory input as we navigate life and form these, these uh, predictions. Like call them priors, call them patterns, mm -hmm. call them like, oh, don't touch the hot stove because it hurt last time, or don't go near um, someone who harmed me or that type of individual situation, right, right? Right. And then those get laid down kind of tighter and tighter, and it depends on um, you know our cognitive flexibility, like genetically and environmentally. Um, and sometimes they get so uh, stuck or rigid that the incoming sensory information just doesn't have an impact on it. Anorexia is a good example mm -hmm. uh, where you have these rules that are laid down of like, don't eat that, it will make you gain weight. And that becomes like a bigger and bigger rule. Um, but under the influence of psychedelics, you could melt that rule and then give the sensory input, like the intuitive mindful eating or the... Um, alternate ways of viewing things, um, a chance and uh, like reshape the patterns. But there is that window of opportunity um, that might be for psilocybin, what, a couple weeks. Right. And if you're a therapist, a uh, counselor, a coach listening to this episode, you've probably had the experience of working with somebody who understands cognitively mm -hmm. that they need to make a change. And they may, maybe even maybe even understand that their pattern of behavior is immature or it is the product of old programming. 
but they just can't seem to make the connection behaviorally when the emotions mm -hmm. are there, you know, the, the part of them that would make the rational decision is locked in the cellar. And in, in my experience working with ketamine, one of these psychedelics that we work mm -hmm. with is that people, while they have a ketamine experience and things are a little looser, we've heated up that mind can make sort of a heart head connection. Yeah. And yeah. Especially with my clients with OCD, I've noticed this like, oh, this is what it actually feels like to not worry about washing my hands 10 times in certain temperature degree water, right? You get a break. Yeah. They get a break, they, but they have an embodied lived experience of that break yeah. instead yeah. of just it occurring to them cognitively. And that's why in something like OCD or anorexia, we're not expecting one dose of ketamine or one dose of psilocybin, even a high dose, to change it like it might your smoking cessation pattern or your depressive episode even. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, the idea is that those really tightly held um, rigid thought patterns might take, you know, bigger doses and a lot of therapy paired with it in a very strategic way and repeated. Yeah. I'm glad you're saying this because I think we, you know, we're not shy about our excitement about psychedelics mm -hmm. and their ability to help. And uh, a lot of people are getting excited, but uh, there's no such thing as a panacea. Mm -hmm. And th these things, even though the the book title, How to Change Your Mind is a sexy book title, uh, <laughs> they aren't going to do the work for you. Yeah. And so on that entropic brain theory, it's interesting to look at mental health conditions on the spectrum ranging from entropy or chaos to rigidity, control, order, uh, and the ones we're talking about, like OCD, would plot on the the rigid or ordered part of the spectrum. Um, anxiety disorders, anorexia, um, like I like don't eat that because it will make you fat, as an example of a thought pattern. But then on the opposite end of the spectrum, you'd have things like binge eating disorder. Can't stop an out of control eating episode or right. um, depression can't get out of bed versus anxiety like can't leave bed like mm -hmm. too controlled on the far end of the entropy spectrum would be psychosis and um, schizophrenia and that's and mania like mm -hmm. just disorganized and that's why we're extra cautious with psychedelics that cr bring about a state of entropy in people who have or maybe too, too much yeah. to begin with. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. Yeah, a little too entropic. And I mean, not saying it couldn't be helpful. It's just there's a higher chance of staying in that disordered state. Yeah. You know, uh, the another interesting um, thing to look at with psilocybin is like how it's different than traditional antidepressants, mm. you know, like psilocybin versus Prozac, for example. Um and just how, you know, I've been struck and really bullish on the research when I looked at these receptors, even though they're both targeting serotonin receptors, how um, SSRIs have more of a numbing effect uh, towards emotions and psychedelics have more of an emotional connection and release. Mm. You know, even though that can be intense for a moment, like taking an SSRI is more of like setting the depression in a plastered cast and letting it like, and hoping for some healing in the right way. Mm -hmm. And then hopefully getting rid of it before too long. Cause you don't want to be in that cast forever. Um, I, and I know some people are on it for a long time and it's very helpful. Yeah. Um, so I want to give this analogy carefully, but there's a, there is a different neuroscientific um, mechanism going on with psychedelics that move towards emotion and like limbic system um, action versus uh, numbing. Right. Yeah. And there's some evidence that there's lots of crosstalk between regions of the brain that don't normally talk to one another mm -hmm. uh, on psychedelics. And maybe that, would you say, is also different compared yeah. to standard SSRIs? Yeah. I love uh, to think about the old, this is your brain on drugs ads mm -hmm. with a cracked egg in a frying pan and those scary dare campaign ads from back in the day. But now when you hear this is your brain on drugs, you see a picture of your brain with 
dormant neuronal pathways. And then you see a picture on something like psilocybin where it's lit up, like right. new pathways can fire and connect and speak to one another that were previously forbidden from mm -hmm. doing that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, comparing psilocybin to something like Prozac, I hear you saying that uh, there, there might be a similar mechanism of action, at least on certain serotonin receptors, but that's only a small part of the story. And there is a lot yeah. of other things that are going on with psilocybin that maybe aren't going on with your standard SSRI. Yeah, it's like we were talking about with, that, with LSD the other week mm -hmm. um, when with the analogy of cerebral jazz, where we're taking the orchestra conductor out when you give a psychedelic so that the uh, orchestra doesn't have to follow their rules and they can freestyle and make something cool up. Yeah. yeah. You know, this is making me think of, there was an, uh, a, a publication that, that recently sort of made a lot of chaos uh, stating that the idea of a chemical imbalance is outmoded yeah. And we don't really know what's going on when we give people antidepressants that uh, it's not that you have not enough serotonin and Prozac's going to give you more serotonin and that's not going to make you depressed. Uh, I don't know that I have a, a strong statement on any of that. It just, it was interesting mm -hmm. to see people react to it. Um, and as I understand it, you know, psychiatric science has, has long been past the idea that it's simply a chemical imbalance. Um, but we don't really necessarily know mm -hmm. what's going on in the brain, neurochemically or electrically. Uh, but we are observing that when we make certain changes with a drug like a psychedelic or a drug like an SSRI, it tends to lead to different experiences. So mm -hmm. that's like as generic as hell, but uh, it's hard to get specific. We still don't know yeah. a lot. Yeah, that, was re that really made waves in the, in the headlines. And there's a risk of of uh, getting overzealous with headlines yeah. because some of them really concern me because um, people jump to conclusions in some of the, the media's take on it that antidepressants don't work or that people should stop taking them, but that's not the case. This That study that came out last month, all it did was summarize the big uh, body of scientific literature that says that the serotonergic hypothesis of depression is not um, is not the story. It's not the answer, as far as we know. Um, and it just kind of drove that home. But it doesn't change the fact that there were hundreds of placebo-controlled trials of antidepressants showing that they were better than placebo, and they helped, and they've saved lives. Like they have a role, even with that like wound in a plastered cast analogy. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes that's what's needed to help someone heal a terrible wound, yeah. right? And some, and that's what we've had available. Right. Yeah, yeah so maybe the wrong conclusion if, after reading those headlines is, oh, SSRIs don't work. Yeah. That's the wrong conclusion. Maybe right. the, the right, I mean, as you just cited, the efficacy studies are there. It helps a lot of people. It doesn't help everybody. Yeah, and uh, even the Royal College of Psychiatrists in the UK came out with a statement three years ago saying, yeah, the monoamine or serotonergic hypothesis is not the explanation of depression. We know that, um, and more work is needed. Um, but uh, yeah, and part of the challenge with the antidepressant studies is there's a strong placebo response, 20 to 30% placebo response in depression studies because... You're bringing someone into clinic and you're giving them something that might help, like a little dose of, of hope and, um, and holding them through that, even though it's funny, the training we get in clinical trials is like, don't be too warm and bubbly. We need mm. to like, <laughs> we need to keep the psychotherapy out of the equation and just focus on the red, blue, red pill or the blue pill. <laughs> You can't avoid it, though. I mean, they're they're coming in for a clinical trial. They're, it's not like we're ambushing them with something yeah. they don't know about. They're coming in for a potential treatment. So there's got to there's got to be hope. You wouldn't approach oh, yeah. a clinical trial. Yeah, it's this, a given. It's audaciously li labeled a antidepressant. So, you know, you're yeah. And like I said, I welcome the placebo response. I like. I love it and bring it on personally and in others. Like you know, let's get. 
that hope and healing and uh, like reduce suffering from anywhere we can get. So when you've got a medicine that has the placebo response and the medicine effect, like in SSRI studies, um, compared to just the placebo effect, then great. Yeah, like analyze the risk benefit. And for that individual, you know, you know, maybe that medicine should be taken for a time, you know, right. but uh, it does get challenging in psychedelic studies, of course. The other interesting thing, though, is in a psychedelic study where we have a non-daily pill, we give a dose and then we watch what happens over five to 10 hours. We can learn a lot about the brain um, in that controlled setting when you've taken all the the co-founding variables of day-to-day -day life out of the equation, like mm -hmm. what happens when you go home mm -hmm. and you get yelled at or you slip into patterns between then and your next visit. Like it really is like Stan Groff said, this uh, like the telescope for astronomy or the microscope for biology, psychedelic science. Yeah, the potential to learn. So, I mean, that's something that some people, I'm glad you brought it up because that's something that some people probably miss. We're excited about studying these things because they might be great treatments for mental health conditions. But uh, we should be equally as excited about uh, what we can learn about the human mind. Yeah. About the, the meat between your ears, the human brain, but also the human mind, about consciousness itself. And as you look at the history, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that human beings have been playing around with mushrooms and altered consciousness for thousands and thousands of years. That we're just sort of rediscovering what our ancient ancestors have probably known for a long, long time. Yeah. And uh, that, I mean, we're talking about the mental health uses mostly. Mm -hmm. You know, I know we're meandering through history, but it does bring up the the other potential benefits. Like, <laughs> I remember hearing Paul Stamets talk at like a MAPS conference two, three years ago. Mm -hmm. Um and saying how he wished he could give eight grams of eight dried grams of magic mushrooms to all the politicians out there. <laughs> that should be required. Like you get sworn in oath of office and then you have a, you know, a heroic dose of magic mushrooms. Mm, that's a, that's a good idea. Let's, let's see what the listeners think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think our listeners would be, would be in, would be fans. We'll read anything else that we want to share with our dear listeners about psilocybin. No, I think uh, I think we've covered a lot of ground and we're just scratching the surface. So I'm sure we'll talk about it again, especially as things like Measure 109 in Oregon mm -hmm. unfolds mm -hmm. and the Utah Task Force assembled here to look at potential like uses. Um, and legislation around psilocybin and other things. Yeah, I think psychedelic science, psychedelic assisted medicine has finally gotten the attention of legislators. And uh, I think we're gonna see a lot of changes over the next couple <laughs> of years. There was even uh, the other day, I think I may have texted to you, but there was a Mormon bishop, current Mormon bishop, mm -hmm. interviewed on a podcast by our friend Jimmy Ricks uh, about his recent trip to Rhythmia to get ayahuasca. Yeah. He was a former Utah politician too. So interesting. Yeah, it's it's amazing times. I'm glad for, for people who are willing to come forward about things like that because I think it helps reduce, has the potential to help reduce the stigma and lots of good reasons to reduce stigma. Again, we don't encourage illicit use of these substances. We don't encourage irresponsible use of these substances. Um, but what, what we love about destigmatization is that hopefully that flows to the top and the people who get to make decisions for the rest of us will be influenced by that destigmatization, and we can we can work our way out of this silly war on drugs yeah. and, and well war on humans. Yeah, sharing is advocacy, telling healing stories, and I know you have to use your own judgment mm -hmm. about when and where and how. But like going to the jungle and taking a plant medicine for your healing or your spirituality or your consciousness, and telling that story. Um, I think is a great form of advocacy. It's like the, the psychonauts coming out of the closet. Yeah. There we go. We welcome all of you to come out of the closet. Yeah. Well, thanks, Reed. Good conversation as per usual. All right. See you next time. Yeah. Thank you, dear listener, for listening. It means a lot to me. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to the podcast on whatever platform you're using to listen or watch. 
Also, if you're feeling generous today, please leave us a glowing review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or wherever you like to listen. Thanks again. The content of this podcast does not constitute medical advice or mental health treatment. Please consult a medical or mental health professional if you believe you are in need of mental health treatment.